certain Republican legislators are moving towards laying certain groundworks that are beginning the states of essentially limiting access to contraceptives, okay? We have to go, what is the motivation behind these bills? The problem is that like young voters of tomorrow aren't old enough to realize what Christian nationalists are doing. That is the groundwork for future contraceptive attacks. I think it's really important to have politically informed populace. I think it's really important that people know what's going on. And owning the libs is the new countercultural phenomenon. That's how you're edgy and countercultural now. And here's the here's the biggest here's the irony to me, okay? Don't think they remember when Christian lobbyists were like much more politically active and effective. Like like weird to us because that was standard culture. I think a lot of people are beginning to notice that the contraceptive mentality is the beginning of the pride mentality. Because the contraceptive mentality divorces sex from the consequences of sex. It introduces a sterile sexual ethic, which is exactly what gave us the pride movement. There, there's no distinction here. If you can't read between the lines, the conclusion that one draws is that condoms are kind of gay. <laughs> Let's, to put it as bluntly as possible, okay? And it, it's not a coincidence that female conservative influencers noticed by NBC News are beginning to pick up on that. Bad ideas can have a very long run, but eventually, and this is the conservative consolation, reality reasserts itself in the end. And people are beginning to realize, okay, if I don't like this insane anarchistic view of sex that is totally self-centered and divorced from any ends whatsoever, well, then maybe I got to rewind it and ask, well, what is the point of sex? Just why it's not, it's not going to be the patriarchy that's coming for your consequence-free birth control. It's not going to be the men. It's, the men, frankly, are huge supporters of, of birth control and contraception because it allows them to have consequence-free sex. It's going to be those conservative women. That's who's coming for it. NBC News is right to be worried. Now, All right. There's a lot in there. We're going to talk about it together, okay? This is going to be a group discussion. <laughs> so... At one point, in the middle of his of his rant, he talks about the word eunuch making. Okay, right here, eunuch making procedures that they call transgenderism. Okay, eunuch making is actually really important here because it's specifically referring to a concept that gets talked about a lot in like kind of hyper fundamentalist religious circles, and it comes out of uh, Matthew, uh, nineteen twelve. Okay. I'll read it for you. You guys are getting some Bible less study, okay? This is just showing this from Matthew 19, 12. For there are some eunuchs which were born from their mother's womb. There are some eunuchs which were made eunuchs of men, and there are eunuchs which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. And he's able to receive it and let him receive it. So there are a lot of Christians uh, that will use this verse both to be opposed to gays and opposed to transgenderism now. They'll basically say that eunuchs made by God, by by birth, basically, they're born eunuchs are gay men and Christians, fundamentalist Christians would argue that these gay men have basically the burden of celibacy put upon them. And it's kind of like their spiritual moral duty to maintain celibacy because they're not attracted to women uh, in order to like edify God, essentially. That would be the argument. I'm not going to talk about why it's really bad theology um, because all biblical deconstructivism is really bad theology. Uh, however, what it is important to understand is the point that I'm talking about here, which is specifically religious political pundits trying to sneak in their religious worldview. And then they'll use like words like, well, it's better for society. You know, casual sex is bad. But remember, he's a Catholic. Catholic they don't care about utilitarianism. They're deontologists. Even if casual sex was the best thing for humanity, they would still be opposed to it according to their own worldview, right? Another form of eunuch making that like it gets talked about with the Matthew 19 is uh, basically trans people. So they'll talk about how basically like trans people are eunuch made by man from, from the same Bible verse, claiming that basically if you make yourself a eunuch, the only reason you can do so is for the sake of celibacy, right? Which again, it's a pretty big bastardization, but I'm not gonna go into like a ton of the theology of like why I think this verse is wrong here, blah, blah, blah. That's not the point of today. The point of today is to outline something that I think is really important, which is again, 
an underlying narrative of their argument, which is to place certain societal constraints grounded in their moral Christian religious beliefs under the banner of common good. They advocate, for instance, a restrictive non pre like a restriction on all non-procreative sexual activities, equating everything to sodomy. Half the girls that he's citing here, by the way, who do list some of their concerns about birth control, some of them are pretty extreme. One of them is basically being like, you know, birth control is pretty hard on women's body. It's kind of like weird that it's like pushed down women's throat as like the main form of contraception, right? There's going to be like the feminist talking point about contraception and birth control specifically, but these women aren't saying, so we should legally eliminate it, okay? And it's really important to understand that what happens when the church blends with the state is that like beliefs that the church holds about whatever it happens to be, they try to enforce as political law. It's essentially a tyrannizing of secular people, right? It's basically saying it doesn't matter if you don't believe in my spaghetti monster in this guy or my God, you still have to follow the tenets of my faith legally politically. And they're doing this right now by doing things like trying to limit access to contraceptives. So these perspectives are not stemming, by the way, from an analysis of societal outcomes. It's from an inherent belief system that views casual sex as inherently wrong. This is why, for example, when the red pill is starting to cozy up to trad conness, it doesn't make any sense. The red pill loves casual sex, okay? If you're red pill, if you think casual sex is a thing that you enjoy and you like to maintain that habit in your lifestyle, just to be clear, it's not super good. I'm reading from a document. I have a couple of like uh, clips prepped uh, to order all this because I've been working on researching this for a while. So it's super important that you understand that if you're in any way enjoy partaking in casual sex. In fact, if you want to engage in casual sex with your wife or girlfriend and also have access to ways to preventing pregnancy, these people are actively moving towards thwarting you from doing this, which is why I think it's really important to talk about. And I think it's something really interesting. So one thing that I talk a lot about is that like typically what we see politically is we see like reactions to reactions to reactions to reactions, right? I've talked about this a fair bit, right? And so um, there's a huge kind of, we have the 2016 Gamergate, for example, which was a reaction to certain things that were occurring in gaming development world that seemed distinctly unfair towards women, right? The way that women were talked to, treated, et cetera, et cetera. Whether you agree with that or not, that was a reaction to an ex a perceived experience and a counter reaction to that was those who are anti SJW, right? We kind of had like the rise of the alt right essentially. And so what we see politically is like constant reactions, reactions, reactions without any like forethought of like what's good. But the issue is politicians are fundamentally supposed to be representative of the people and putting in policies that's good for us. So I want to be super clear because I'm not trying to fear around her before somebody tries to say, I'm not trying to say they're coming after your condoms today. You know, if you go to the store tomorrow, there won't be a single, the single speck of spermicide inside. It'll be stripped away from you. I'm not saying that. Okay. I'm not trying to be like alarmist and, and, and an insight again, another reaction to a reaction. As you guys know, that's not really what I do here. What I'm interested actually in doing, though, is talking about how what's going on right now is that certain Republican legislators are moving towards laying certain groundworks that are beginning the states of essentially limiting access to contraceptives. Okay. And there's a whole bunch of social media figures and political pundits, not so much Michael Nolas. I don't think Gen Z and the younger generations love him, but people like Sneeko, people like Nick Fuentes, and people like Andrew Tate, who are increasingly coding up to religious views and normalizing it. Because in many ways, being religious and owning the libs is the new countercultural phenomenon. That's how you're edgy and countercultural now. It's like, oh yeah, well, I love the Bible. <laughs> get wrecked, right? Which like any millennial or any generation above, it's like weird to us because that was standard culture back in, back in the day. So with politicians today attempting to basically lay legislative groundwork and the voters of tomorrow that are increasingly leaning into kind of this like tradcon perspective that are very anti woke scold interested in owning a libs, it creates a concerning future where contraception may become restricted. And here's the thing, I think, I think it's really important to have politically informed populace. I think it's really important that people know what's going on. And good politics tends to be gradual, it tends to be thought out and over time. And so what's happening today is groundworks that in 20 years, if you, we, we do nothing about, 
is going to be the, the foundation that things that we probably really disagree with are built up, which we don't want, right? Especially if you're pro contraception access, for example, that includes things like hormonal birth control, IUDs, stuff like that. And here's the, here's the biggest, here's the irony to me. Okay. The like younger population, I think, especially, I don't think they remember when Christian lobbyists were like much more politically active and effective. Like, do you, for the older, like millennials, do you guys remember in like the early 2000s <laughs> when, um, there was like the panic about video games and having violence in video games. And there's a bunch of talking points about how like sexuality and violence in video games is bad. And there was a whole bunch of Christian religious groups basically trying to like censor video games so that there was like no shoot. Like they were, they hated first person shooters, any amount of blood, probably most of the video games that you personally enjoy, they were super opposed to. And they were like claiming some like crazy science that it like, uh, it was like, I remember one talking point because I grew up in this world. Remember I was fundy Christian growing up. I remember learning yeah, if you watch video games where you shoot people, it's the same thing that's given to like soldiers to train them to normalize them on being okay with killing people. Which, just to be clear, I don't know if the military is implementing uh, CSGO anytime soon. I'm dubious though. I'm a little dubious. And research was done and it was like, oh, it turns out none of this is true. Like, we just made shit up. They just made stuff up, right? Because it was like, well, it feels true and it feels really spooky. Do you guys remember that? Or do you remember in the early 2000s when there was like the massive pop-off of young earthers that were trying to like change education? I remember this because my school had a big drama about it. And they were, these young earthers were basically trying to enforce that biology has to teach the option of a young earth, which is claiming that the earth is like 10,000 year olds and that evolution doesn't exist. It's like a very uh, kind of like weird new wave Christian view. And thankfully we had people like the skeptics, like uh, Christopher Hitchens, who fought with them in in kind of the social domain that debated they outlined why this is a terrible idea where there's no empirical evidence behind this um and prevented like these things from being implemented like hardcore into school curriculum and so the problem is that like young voters of tomorrow aren't old enough to realize what christian nationalists are doing and specifically the implications of what happens if your cool Christian nationalist who's owning the libs gets the policies that they want implemented into the country. Like they're just being like, yeah, screw LGBTQ, FISA 2444, colon, colon, whatever, right? The, like the meme of, of the LGBTQ community, right? As long as it's like screwing over the, the woke schools, they're kind of happy, but they're not thinking about, okay, well, if today there's a restriction on things like plan B, and hormonal birth control, that is the groundwork for future contraceptive attacks. And there is interest in that, as Michael Knoll has said. So uh, I'm going to show you the policy, okay? Because I'm not just making shit up, right? Because, you know, I need receipts. So is there actually policy being rolled out? So that's a really important question that you should be asking me for my claims. So here you go. I'm going to show you a video. Um, it's focused in on just like one state, uh, but I'll talk about a couple of other states and bring up like relevant receipts and stuff like that. Just give me one second. And this is from uh, two weeks ago. I'm going to point out a couple of things that I think are really valuable here. So first and foremost, the like Christian lobbyist groups that are like moving towards limiting things like contraception are not the same majority of everyone because I will show you data on this later. Most people are pro-contraception. Most people have no problem with comedones and hormonal IUDs. Most people even support IUDs. I think it's like 81%, right? So when I'm talking about like the religious conservatives, I'm talking about a fringe niche group. The problem is that the fringe niche group is very boots on the ground. They're very, very motivated. And for some of you who aren't aware, there is currently going on a bit of a tension within the Catholic church specifically, where there is a massive trad con movement that part of the frustrations that they have with the Pope, for example, and the church at large is that the church is less politically involved. And so it's important to understand that when I'm talking about like religious conservatives, I'm obviously talking about very specific types of individuals. The problem is that like highly motivated squeaky wheels sometimes get the grease. And in this case, the grease might be political action, right? Because they're super motivated. And so just to be clear, this is a good example of a Christian woman who's part of a group that's actively working to ensure contraception, right? So most normal sane Christians are fine with contraception, right? But there is a fringe group and it's important to outline this. I'm talking about specifically like essentially like Christian nationalists, like people who want to remeld the church and state. Um, 
really want to point that out. She does a good job, you know, business suit and the nose piercing emphasizes, you know, she's chill. <laughs> I can't imagine a world where my four kids do not have access to contraception. I didn't think that was a possibility, um, but when Roe v. Wade was turned, I realized I should probably spend less time watching the Kardashians and Housewives in my off time, and probably more time getting involved in public policy. Friends, for those of you who identify as Christian, public policy and politics is a deeply spiritual position and place and thing that we all need to be a part of. We're talking about medical rights core rights, medical rights. This is just the beginning. Bodies really matter, especially as a Christian woman. I think of the incarnation, the fleshy, messy business of being a body and having the bodily right, the autonomy, the agency. Autonomy and agency are essential to my well-being and essential to my body and to the bodies of my children and to the bodies of all women. This is going to affect women more than anyone else. So I implore you, stand up, and do what is right. We need to make contraception a right. And if that is not enough, we also need to make those who stand against it, they need to be very clear. I love Brene Brown, clear is kind. We either need to make this a right or our elected officials need to be clear that they are against con the right to medical contraception, medical rights for all bodies. So friends, get in the fight and do it with love and kindness and passion. Okay. Uh, I think she does the best job of like outlining this. So. What is this press conference in respond to, response to? So this is, uh, I'm just going to confirm, I believe this is Virginia. Um. Good morning and welcome everyone. I'm Bree Thomas, the CEO of Affirm, the designated Title X agency in Arizona. For the Arizona, okay, just wanted to make sure. Okay, so you might be curious like what they're responding to here. So I'm going to go through a couple of different uh, bills and whatnot that have been put forward one of the most important things for you to kind of know when it comes to contraception is that um, this kind of all starts with the overturning of Roe v. Wade. That's probably where we should start historically. So Roe v., as many of you know, Roe v. Wade was overturned last year. Um, and immediately uh, there's major concerns because, um, just going to try to find it here, because Justice uh, 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 Thomas Clarence started talking about how basically one of the important precedents for essentially Roe, uh, uh, for, sorry, uh, contraception in America, he basically said that like, this is another questionable ruling that we need to start looking at. And so it's really, really important for me to kind of like note here, I guess, my position on a lot of this stuff. Um, so overturning Roe v. Wade, I think for the most part, I understand it, even though I think it sucks. The problem is that their TradCon content creators are using kind of like the surge of the Roe v. Wade to start looking at a whole bunch of other like rights. And I think that um, when we just listened to did a really good job of basically outlining that when we're talking about rights, we're not talking about rights to contraception. That's what, I, that's what like the conservatives keep trying to label it as. What we're really talking about here is rights to family planning, right? You do have a right in America, I would hope as a liberal democracy, to think about and plan your family. And there are medical interventionisms that allow you to do this. And I'm concerned about any sort of policy that is going to limit this. So a really important thing to go over first is going to be the Virginia bills. So, so there's a couple of different groundwork things that essentially uh, politicians are using to build some, sort of the scaffolding that's going to be pro or anti-contraception. And it is going to be um, become increasingly important because multiple states are starting to have bills passing talking about specifically contraception. So there's a bunch of words that you need to know, okay? Um, but this is the act that you need to be aware of. This is called the Right to Contraception Act, okay? This is a super important uh, Congress, Congressional Act that is being put through right now. So this is essentially trying to secure rights to contraception, hence the act. <laughs> okay, so it defines a couple of words here that are important, terms like what contraception is, what a contraceptive is, all the sort of things, all the good stuff. Um, I will link this here in the chat in case you would like to go check it out. Um, I'm not gonna go over it in detail. However, uh, there have been a number of states that have been moving to basically strike this down. So why does this matter? If you, in your state, if they strike this down, it's a, it's leaving contraception open. It's kind of like in this gray 
unlitigated space, which if you want to be later make bills to restrict people's right to access to contraception, you would need to strike down this bill. So essentially any state that's looking at this and striking it down, well, there might be multiple reasons, I'm not just going to say that any state striking it down hates women and just wants to make sure that they don't have access to contraception. It does basically go, you should probably put a flag there. You should be thinking about this as a as a citizen. If you want to make sure that you, if you enjoy casual sex, this is something, unfortunately, that you need to be paying attention to, to some degree. There's also a, another method. So there, some states are trying to strike this down, this bill, the uh, congressional bill that I outlined, Right to Contraception Act. Other states are actually creating new bills that do have some limits. They're being discussed right now. Most of them are in committee. None of them have gone through, but there are, are bills being put forward that are specifically about certain forms of contraceptives, but they're doing it in a really sneaky way. So this is a bill in Virginia. They absolutely struck down the HRS bill. Uh, they basically voted against the Right to Contraception Act. Um, there are also multiple states that are basically introducing legislation that could ban forms of hormonal birth control. So this is where I'm going to actually pull up this. So this is the House bill. Okay, there we go. I knew I had it somewhere. Got it. We did it, chat. We did it. All right. So the Ohio bill basically is bill house bill 704 and so it's essentially about conferring personhood so this is about abortion specifically however they're essentially trying to say that abortion occurs life occurs at conception right so if life confer confers at conception then that means that any sort of thing that blocks implantation would be considered some form of abortion so they use a really fancy word here in the bill uh, it is called Good, good luck pronouncing it. It is called abortoficients. Abortoficients. Yes, that is what they are called. Okay. Abortoficients are super important to understand. So abortoficients are essentially um, what they're labeling as contraceptives that block implantation. However, it's super important to note here that abortoficients depending on how you label it, could include multiple types of hormonal birth control. So this is in Ohio right now. They're talking about it right now. It's going through the readings. It's going through votings. It's being sponsored. Um, it is this bill that I brought up. So as you can see, this is the status of the bill. Sorry that I like brain farted on you. So they're voting on it right now. As I said, every single person who's just like trying to implement this is religious. And they explicitly list in their things like hormonal IUDs. So IUDs, in this bill are being suggested as being an abortificient, right? So essentially abortion adjacent is how they're calling this thing. Here's the problem with this. The problem with this is that it's not super clear. IUDs don't just prevent like implantation. They do multiple things, which in includes, for example, making it difficult for sperm to survive in the uterus, right? Making it so that the actual ovulation, uh, making it so that the ovulation doesn't occur, hormonal, and also. So the problem is if you consider hormonal birth control as part of essentially abortificients, then that essentially is saying that multiple types of hormonal birth control is just like not allowed anymore, right? Which is, as you can imagine, a really, really bad idea. Um, I'm going to give you an example. So Dip, dip, dip. Hold on, I'm going to pull all these things out together before I try to give you examples because this is a nightmare. Some of you may know, but there were a bunch of medications that were listed as essentially being like related to uh, abortion. So uh, after the Roe v. Wade was overturned, there was a huge flood of essentially like um, them trying to block things like uh, methotextrate Rx. So after Roe v. Wade, basically certain contraceptives were being considered as basically, let's just call them abortion pills, right? So plan B is one of these things, which does seem to more directly, but then they're including things under this med, any sort of medication that could be abortion related. So afterwards, there was uh, a couple of issues where basically pharmacies were not giving people like methotextrate, which is usually used for rheumatoid arthritis. However, it also can be used as an abortificient, essentially, as a drug. And so people who with rheumatoid arthritis weren't getting access to this. So this is the way where like these little bills that seem like a good idea suggest to you that like, there's got to be other motivation here. In what world uh, would you think, for example, that by banning just 
all medications that are board efficient, that you're doing a good for, for society, that this is somehow what your constituents want. Any constituent with rheumatoid arthritis would be like, or don't, here's a thought, or don't, right? And so there's a really big issue where we have to go, what is the motivation behind these bills? Why are they being introduced? Are they actually reflective of the constituents that they're supposed to be representing? Because if they're not, I don't, I don't know why we'd even be talking about it. And so if you're in, for example, Virginia or Ohio, if you're in Wisconsin, if you're in North Carolina, it's extremely important that you start kind of like having your finger on some of these things. 